Good morning, beloved. Brought my water this week. Voice is still not back altogether. As the kids are leaving and they're heading, uh, many of them elementary, to the cafeteria where they have class spaces, um, do you remember what it was like to go into a cafeteria those first few days of school every year? No? <laughs> it's too, too far back? I mean, I do. I think, I think most of us know that, that tension of like the first few days of school, you go into the cafeteria and like you go into class and the teacher is likely going to give you an assigned seat or soon will when she realizes that's, that's not a good idea to not give them or whatever. But you go into the cafeteria and it's a free-for-all. Like, where do you sit? You get to choose where you sit. I was like, well, where, where can I sit? Uh, and then what does it say about me when I choose where I sit? If I'm allowed to sit there? Like all these questions... They, they just bring up such attention of, like, where am I allowed to be? Where do I belong? A, a word we use a lot around here. Um, I recently re-entered such a situation at a big parent meeting. Um, for, I'm, I'm going to be gone a few days this week with my son for a field trip out of town, and uh, there's this big parent meeting. And so I go into this larger room, and there's a bunch of parents, and, and it felt kind of like going into the cafeteria as a high schooler, like, oh, where do I, where, where do I fit in here? Um, it's it very sad. And yet, like, please be kind. These are my insecurities coming out. But uh, do you know what peacocking is? No? Okay, so peacocking is, is a reference to typically male behavior, um, but the, it's applied to humans, but it actually comes from the, the peafowl um, type of bird. Uh, there's peacocks and peahens, but peacocks are the male version of this bird, and they have these big, beautiful feathers and train and all this stuff, um, but when they, when they decide like it's time to have a mate and reproduce, they, they actually have this unusual behavior where all the males actually come together. Like, they don't run and go find ladies, they come together and they put on this, this big display. And so they congregate together and they're trying to stand out. And it's really fascinating. I kind of nerded out this week on this, uh, but the, the peacocks, the, the females will come up and if the female has like any interest at all in the peacock, um, she'll come up like directly on, like at a 90 to that peacock and they'll kind of like scurry up and everything. And then he'll like, he'll get all displayed and everything, his big feathers and stuff. And then he'll turn out a 45 to her because he wants the light of the sun to come through and like glimmer and stuff. And then if she decides to engage, then he gives like this little shiver thing. And it's like, okay, <laughs> game on. Um, but it all starts with all these males coming together and like they congregate and they decide like who gets to be at the middle of this thing is like the dominant peacock. And so they've got to come together and decide, where do you belong in this whole thing? Like, like a cafeteria, like seats taken kind of thing. We all remember that movie on the bus. But where do I actually sit? Like all this stuff. And so it felt a little bit like peacocking as I, as I settled into this situation with this parent meeting, which is really weird. But like we come together and like these are dads. So there's, there's no need to impress any ladies. And like the ladies are not even part of the conversation. It's just this whole thing where like, I felt like that. Um, it, it's a discussion of businesses and your success and what business you started or you're a part of and your position and the vacations they get to take their families on and the new vehicles they just bought and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there listening to all this and you know the, the diff with the guy who like shrinks back into the shrubs? That's kind of how I felt. I was like, like, what do I do? Just try to be happy to listen and hope they don't ask me anything. Hope they don't expect me to say anything because I'm, I'm just sitting there like feeling so insecure. Well, that's the, the thing is deep insecurities have a tendency to rise up into the shallow end. A deep insecurities tend to rise up into the shallow end where you can't hide them anymore. And, and all of that happens because we're comparing ourselves to others. This, this trap of comparison. And, and I want to start today with a personal confession that this sermon is really hard for me. Like, Far more often than I want to admit, I struggle with comparing my life to those around me. But like I, I left that meeting hearing like all these things and thinking like, okay, well, how much of that's actually true? And like, be content with what you have, Kevin. It's okay. And all this stuff. And, and this guy that I've known for a long time hops up and just like immaculate brand new F450. Or it's like, I'm going to go over here and get in my pick em up truck. And go. <laughs> like, why? Why do I have this tendency to compare myself? And, and like one of my greatest idols is achievement and performance, that I feel this need to prove myself all the time. And if there's nothing to prove myself against, 
I'd be nothing. But there's so much to compare myself against. And so I, I want to enter into this teaching today just admitting to you, this is really hard for me. Um, deep insecurities like to rise to the shallow end. But at the heart of this struggle, I'm fully convinced the heart of this struggle is a question of what do I truly deserve? With, a, with an honest answer to the question of what do I truly deserve, those deep insecurities rising up can be dealt with. And so we need to jump into that today. We're continuing our series, Good Ground, um, working through the parables of Jesus um, that are recorded in the gospel according to Matthew. And so as we continue that, I want to remind you that a parable is a teaching device that Jesus loved to employ, and it's, it's where he would tell a short story to illustrate a spiritual truth. And so we read these parables, and um, there may be multiple truths in that, but generally there's going to be a focus that he's trying to make. And, and we can get in trouble if we, if we simplify them too much to say, oh, it's just this, but we can also get in trouble if we try to break them apart too much and allegorize every aspect of them. And so we want to read them largely in context and understand what is the point of this parable. And so to that end, we actually have to start with the chapter prior. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20, if you want to make your copy of scripture ready, at the start of the chapter, Matthew chapter 20. But to understand what Jesus is about to say, we need to back up into chapter 19. In chapter 19, we have this exchange take place where Jesus has been teaching, he's been healing, he's been doing amazing things. He's quite popular at this point. And this young guy comes. He's called the rich young ruler. Do you remember him? This rich young ruler comes walking up to Jesus and he says, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus starts, and he's like, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but God, which is this beautiful way of him actually acknowledging he is good. He didn't say he's not good. He is God. But he says, you, you know the commands. And he lists off some of the commands of, of the Old Testament scriptures. And he ends with, love your neighbors yourself. And, and the guy, a little quick reflection, whether he's honest or not, he's like, you know, I've done all these. I've done all these since my youth. And Jesus is like, well, there's one more thing. Why don't you, why don't you go sell everything you own and give it to the poor? And the guy, being this wealthy man of power, this wealthy young man of power, says he walked away grieved because he had many possessions. That the one thing Jesus said you must do, he just couldn't quite do it. Like what you, what you have wrapped up your identity in, that you have acquired all this stuff, you've achieved all this stuff. I want you to walk away from that. Give it all up, give it to the poor and then come follow me. And instead of following Jesus, he walks away grieved. And then Jesus makes this wild statement. He's like, you know, he's looking back at his disciples, he's like, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, camel, through the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they're like, well, how is this possible? She's like, well, it's impossible with man, but all things are possible with God. And then Peter, kind of like excited in this moment, as he's, he's now doing the comparison thing. He's like, well, Jesus, we, we've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? And Jesus, in response, Jesus starts to tell Peter these amazing things. He's like, you know, um, and the renewal of all things, you'll sit with me in judgment. But you'll sit and judge the 12 tribes with me. And those who've suffered loss will receive a hundred times more and inherit eternal life. That your investment in the kingdom of God, your suffering, your loss for the sake of the king and his kingdom is an investment that receives a hundredfold in return. Like, do you want to go back to the giving time? <laughs> do you want a secure investment? You're like, CDs right now, like 5.4%, that's amazing. Like, just, just do that. Don't, don't do stocks. Like, a hundredfold, a 100-fold return on your investment. Jesus says, that's what it's like to invest in this kingdom. Peter, you get it back a hundred times over. So you left everything to follow me? Oh, you have no idea what the return is going to be like. But you still imagine Peter in that moment really asking the question, but then Jesus makes this odd statement. He says, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. It's how chapter 19 closes out. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. 
So with that context of that exchange with that rich young ruler who walks away and then Jesus making these statements, Peter kind of asking this question and Jesus landing with, but many who are first will be last and the last first. That's what needs to be in our minds as we now enter into this parable. So start in verse one of chapter 20 with me. Four, so four means he's tying this back to what he just said. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into his vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. Does that sound familiar? When those who were hired, about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and burning heat. Comparison. It starts with four, meaning that this parable is tied to what preceded it when Jesus said, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And so there's this vineyard owner. He owns a vineyard, and apparently it is a season where there's a lot of work to be done. And so as a common practice, um, people could go into the center of town, and there would be laborers. There'd be people who are like, I'm here for hire. Like, anybody needs some work today because I'm willing to work. And so um, in this time and place, you would typically get your pay the same day that you worked. And so he owns a vineyard, needs help. He drives into town, and he finds here's a group of guys waiting to be hired. Like, hey, a denarius each, which is basically your typical day salary in this time. Hey, fair pay. I'll pay you a denarius if you'll come work in my vineyard for the day. Sounds fair? We agree. And so first group comes, they jump in, they start working. The guy apparently needs more labor. He gets back, they're underway. He's like, ah, I need some more people. So he goes back into town. He finds another group of guys and he's like, hey, uh, I know the day actually already started, but I'll give you what's right. Like, probably thinking like, okay, we're a little bit into the workday, probably not going to be quite a denarius, but like, fair enough, like I need, I need to work some today, I've got to make something. And so they hop in, they take off, they start working, the guy goes again three more times. And each time, a little bit later in the day, and he shows up, finds more people who are available to work, and he says, I need more help, come on, I'll do the same thing. And so the assumption is he'll do what's right by them. And they all hop in. The last group, get this, the last group that comes, it's five o'clock. It's an hour before quitting time. And he comes in and he's like, what are you guys doing standing here? And like, nobody hired us all day. He's like, come on, come work in my vineyard. And they hop in. And so you've, you've got these people who have been there working all day long. Like, we're gonna receive a denarius. Like, work hard, like do honest work. And let me quick aside here. If you're paid to do something and you agreed to do that, do it. Do it honestly and do it well. So back into this. These guys here, I'm going to do an honest day's worth of work. I'm going to get a denarius at the end of the day, but I watch as the guy who hired me leaves and he comes back with more people at different intervals throughout the day. And we get to the end of the day. Tired. Whew, we've been working all day. Some of these guys, they were working a few hours. Some of them, one of them, like blast group, they've only been here for an hour. Like, they're still like, we're just getting warmed up. And that group gets paid first. The ones who are like, we worked all of an hour. What are we going to get? I hope it's something. And the owner's like, here's a denarius. Here's a full day's pay for that hour that you worked today. Thank you. Have this and be on your way. Can you imagine the excitement? Like, I just worked for an hour and I got paid for an entire day. This is awesome. How do I sign up with that guy tomorrow? Like, oh man, this is amazing. And so the guys who worked all day are watching this take place and they're like, whoa, they worked an hour and they got a full day's pay. This guy must be making bank and he's super generous. Wait till he pays us. 
wait till, and like, you just imagine like the giddy excitement of like, man, if, if he told us a denarius this morning, but like, he just paid them a whole day for an hour. What's he gonna pay us? And they get to their part. They get, it's my turn in line. Worked all day, tired, blisters, hot, sunburnt, everything. And he hands them a denarius. Here's a full day's pay. Uh, like what? Like, those guys worked an hour. We bore the heat of the day. We bore the brunt of the labor. We worked all day. You gave them a full day's pay. And now you're giving us the same? You make us equal with them? And look what he says. Verse 13. He replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? Hey, there's no offense. We agreed on your wage. It's what I said. It's what you agreed to. That's what we did. I want to be generous with them. And isn't it mine to do what I want with it? Wait a second. Okay, are you jealous? Oh, like, the resounding answer is yes. <laughs> like, what is this? They work for an hour and they get the same pay as me when I labored all day for you. But, but wasn't that our agreement? So what's that to you that this is mine to give and I choose to give it so generously? What's that to you? Look at verse 16. Jesus stops the story. And he brings it to bear on them. So the last will be first, and the first last. Chapter 19. Rich young ruler comes, walks away sad because he can't do what Jesus asked him to do. I can't give up what has made me who I am. What would that be like? Peter asks, well, for those of us who did, what's in it for us? And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> You're going, to be, you're going to be repaid a hundredfold. You'll have eternal life. But then almost as a warning says, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. He tells this story of these vineyard workers getting jealous and this very generous owner. And he ends it with changing the order of what verse 30 in chapter 19 was. Hear it again? But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And now he says, so the last will be first, and the first last. But he brings it together. Comparison. Oh, the danger of comparison. What, what about oh, me? What I've done? What, what I deserve? And them? Oh, to see their success to see how easy life is, to see all of this stuff, to fall into comparison. And I have to ask, when like these workers who labored all day, you feel the resentment rise as you compare yourself or others to whatever standard it is that you believe to be right, can you hear and believe God when he says, friend, I'm doing you no wrong? In all of our comparison, like you, you start scrolling through Instagram and you see their vacation, you see their new edition, you see whatever it is, and you immediately start to think like, oh, like there's so many studies now that have proven over and over, it makes you depressed. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say like, let's just be digital ascetists and, and just completely cut it off. I'd, actually, I'd really encourage you to. But like in the very least, can we acknowledge that reality? Put limits on it. Pay attention to the way that it affects you. But when we start to feel that way, whether it's from social media or just looking out at our peer group or whatever it is, can you in that moment hear the voice of God say, friend, I've done you no wrong. And then be honest. I say, lots of times the answer is, yeah, I think you have. It shouldn't be. That's not the right response. But if we're honest, I think... I know for me that lots of times is how I actually feel. So what do we do with this? This danger in comparison. Because if, if that grows in us, this, this tendency to compare our lives and what we get versus what others get, do you know what it does? It just grows bitterness and resentment. And it consumes us. 
We must be able to hear God say, friend, I'm doing you no wrong, and believe him. We must be able to believe him. Norman Huffman is a commentator who, uh, writing about this passage, he says, Jesus deliberately and cleverly led the listeners along by degrees until they understood that if God's generosity was to be represented by a man, such a man would be different from any man ever encountered. He'd be so different. And what would make him different? What would make this man so different? Grace. Grace would make him different. Because what seems to be natural for us is merit. That we start working. Think, okay, a day's wage for a day's work? Agreed. Seems right. And we start working. And we get to the end of the day and like, hey, this, this crew just showed up for the last hour. And wait a second, they just got a whole day's wage? Well, then that, I, I guess I'm going to get eight days wage. I mean, this, this is going to be pretty awesome. And then you're handed a day's wage. What? You've made them equal to me? That's, that's not right. That's not what they have earned. And this parable says, no, 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 the way of this man, the way of God is grace. That it's not merit. Merit seems so natural to us. What we earn is just and right. It's natural to us. But grace is supernatural. It does not make sense to us that God relates to us in a way that says, you will never earn this. You'll never earn this. You could not ever do enough to earn the love and affection of God. You could not ever do enough to make things right between you and God. But God in grace says, no, I love you and I choose you and I will make it right. And don't forget that grace. That's what makes him so different. That of, of all the religions of the world, he'll be like, what is the massive glaring thing that makes Christianity unique from all the others? Grace. That all world religions, all systems of philosophy are trying to answer the question, what's wrong and how do we fix it? Like everything acknowledges there's brokenness. You, you have to be the bird that sticks its head in the sand and it's not a peacock. And it's like, pretend like it's not there. Like, if you have any sight at all, you know that something is broken. And religions are all trying to figure out what is broken and how do we fix it. And Christianity alone says, well, it's not you that can fix it. There is nothing you could do to fix it. God can fix it. And that's grace. That's grace that he would be different he would come in. And so the point of the parable is that God's grace is what the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven depends on. Not what you can do, not what you earn, but what God gives in grace. The bottom line is grace is the currency of the kingdom. You want your, you want your pay? You better bank on grace. This is the way that Craig Blomberg, another commentator, he said this. He said, the reason we object to equal treatment for all is precisely the objection of the workers in this parable. It doesn't seem fair. But we are fools if we appeal to God for justice rather than grace. For in that case, we'd all be damned. Oh, oh that's heavy. That's heavy. But there's the gospel, this good news, this good news that gifts come from God. They're his to give, and he gives them in grace. And the, the very nature of a gift is that it is not earned. It's given. And God in grace says, yes, you have fallen short of my glory. You have rebelled against me. You have defied me and I'm holy and I'm just. And so there is wrath. There is consequence for your sin. There is separation from God who is life and you will face death. It is both physical and spiritual to be separated from life. But a God who in grace says, I love you, made a way that God the Son, Jesus, took on human flesh, stepped into his own creation as the creator in his own creation, the transcendent God over all, imminent, here with us, Emmanuel, God with us. He put on flesh, and then he lived a sinless life that he did not ever rebel against the Father's will. He did not fall short of the glory of God. Instead, he expressed it, he demonstrated it over and over. As the one true human, when we have fallen to be subhuman, made in the image of God, but then 
meant to project and image God to the world, we instead call him a liar when we lie. We instead call him a thief when we steal. We instead make God out to be all these awful things that are we. But Jesus does not. He's the full expression of God, the very image of God. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. And so he lives a sinless life. And you think, like most of the people of the day, oh, he's going to march to victory, turn this whole thing around. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the rescuer. He's the one we've been waiting for to make things right. He will crush the head of the serpent. But when it looks like he's marching into Jerusalem and they're all like, oh, hail the king, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Just days later, they're screaming, crucify him, kill him, make him dead. This is what he deserves. And Jesus stands there thinking, no, this is what you deserve. But he willingly goes to the cross where he is murdered because he literally loved us to death. What a God. He says, there is a consequence for your sin and I'll take it on myself. We talked about this last week. That is the essence of forgiveness. There is just pain. There is retribution that is rightly to be placed on you. And God says, I'll take that on myself. I'll let it end with me. And so he dies in our place, taking on our sin and calling us to repentance, saying, turn from your sin. You have to admit, be honest about who you are. Confess you are a sinner. Turn from that sin and turn to your Savior who is Jesus and then follow him, believing, confessing his Lord, but believing in your heart that he died, but he didn't stay dead. He was raised back to life on the third day. And the promise is we too will be resurrected to new life. And in a sense, we already have been as we're united with Christ by faith. This gospel, this good news that you deserve punishment, you deserve wrath, you deserve death, and yet God says, but I love you. Here is grace. I've made a way to bring you back to be with me. And he is our greatest joy. That he is full satisfaction. He is beauty unimagined. He is majesty off the charts. He is everything we could have ever wanted and more. We will never know the end of his loving kindness. And he wants us to experience that with him forever. Like starting now, but then going on into all of eternity. Oh, what good news. What good news that he is a man of grace. And he is a God of grace. And so we have to remember the currency of the kingdom is grace. Gifts are not earned. Oh, you receive it, this gift of grace. But there's still this tension that we often feel when we see others receiving gifts in God's grace, that danger of comparison, it's still, like, it's still in me that it's so easy for me to slip into thinking, like, what do I deserve? Look, look at what's going on around. What is this, God? <laughs> and you need to start with acknowledging that comparison is actually not wrong or evil, but it can be used wrongly and it can become evil. It's actually necessary for determining what just true reality is and engaging rightly with ourselves and others. You know, scripture calls us to things like when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That requires comparison on your, on your part. Or when the author of Hebrews says, imitate those who persist in faith. It means there, there is a right way to compare and just assess what is reality. Is, is it prudent for me to follow after this person and all these things? But the danger in comparison is when we actually lose grace as the lens. And we start to think based on merit. Like, ooh, what is mine? But if grace is the metric, grace being the undeserved favor of God, being also the power of God to transform us into Christ-likeness and to live in the power of the kingdom, if grace is the metric, we can engage in honest comparison a kind of comparison that will lead us to greater joy, to betterment of ourselves and others and life, as opposed to envy, pain, or defeat. And so which way will we take it? That's the point of the parable. Hey, in response to this exchange, you just watch this rich man walk away sad, and then you ask, well, what about us? We left everything. We kind of did what you said, right? (laughs) And Jesus says, well, first we'll be last. And the last will be first. It's all grace. Oh, dear children, it's all grace. Grace is the currency of the kingdom. You've got to see this personally. 
this week we celebrated Valentine's Day. I don't know if you have family traditions. Um, and, and my family, my wife takes m- my son and they go on a date and I take my daughter and we go on a date and we're trying to teach them like how should a man or a woman be treated and all this stuff. And um, we, we have this tradition of we go downtown and we do the scavenger hunt and it's a race and drive separately, but like we come together, there's a start and like we gotta, we gotta work through this list and it's lots of fun and then be back here at the vehicles and decide who wins and all this stuff. And then afterward, we, we go on a date and let them choose like, where do you wanna eat? Uh, I won't tell you where my daughter picked. It was so sad. Uh, we have work to do, we have work to do. Um, but um, when I got home, my, on, my, on my dresser, there's a Valentine's Day card for me. It's from my son. And so I get this Valentine's Day card from my son. And when I get cards from my kids, whether it's a birthday, holiday, or whatever, or they draw me a picture or whatever, I have this, this spot in my closet that I, I put all of them there. And just, it's nice. I, I like to keep those kinds of things for my kids. So I get this Valentine's Day card from my son. You know what I did with it? I threw it away. I threw it away. That was trash. You know why? The reason it didn't get put up in my closet with my collection of things for my kids is on one side, the first side that I saw, the side facing up, it said, to daddy, love Leland. Oh, yeah, that's so sweet. Like he, he gave me this card. But then as I go to set it back down, I realize there's something on the back side. And on the back side, it said, to Leland from one of his classmates. <laughs> I'm just like, eh, that one's not quite going to go into the collection, you know? Like the, the thing about it is like, this, this is nice, this is nice, but it's not personal. And that's the thing about grace. Is we, we can't just see grace as something that's nice, but not personal. You have to see grace as just this amazingly kind thing of God. But it's personal to us, to each of us, to you personally. Do you know the grace of God? In a way that is so personal. That when you think of your wretchedness, of the way that you have fallen short of the glory of God, that God would love you in grace. And you see the way that God loves you, you personally. The grace of God for you, it's personal. And it changes things. And it empowers us to live in light of that reality, that the first will be last and the last will be first. It's grace. I didn't deserve to be in this party. So whether I came in at the start and had a lot of work to do, or I came in at the end and I was just getting warmed up, oh, I get to be here. I get to be part of this. Oh, what joy. What inexhaustible joy. What a God. I'm reminded, and this is um, sharing a little too much with you, I, I don't have any tattoos. But I often dream of having a tattoo, and I'm just way too fickle. Like, if it's a word, like, I'm not going to like that font six months from now. Or, like, there's, just, there's so many things, like, it's permanent. I don't know. I can't, can't pull the trigger on it. But like, one, of the, one of the ideas I've had, I've had a lot of them. Um, but I, I'd love to have this scene of my favorite story in Scripture, John 21, when Jesus shows up for the third time to the disciples. Do you remember that scene? The prior to this, the disciples had their last supper with Jesus. And Jesus tells them, one of you is about to betray me. And they kind of run through, like, definitely not. That's not happening. Peter, in particular, is like, Lord, no, never happening. Jesus like, actually, all all of you will fall away. It's not just this one that's going to betray me. All of you will fall away. And they prove it to be true. That they leave there singing a hymn across the Kidron Valley in the Garden of Gethsemane Jesus is having such a panic attack that he's sweating blood. And he's asking his friends, Peter, James, and John nearby, guys, just stay awake with me. Come on, just stay awake with me. And they keep falling asleep. Peter, the one who's like, I'd never deny you. And Jesus had said, no, actually, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Nah, not happening. Peter, just stay awake. Just stay awake with me, please. I don't want to be alone right now. And then torches and clubs and soldiers, they all come together. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus, knowing what his friends are all doing, they're all about to abandon him, he defends them. It's just me that you want. And they all take off running. One of them apparently is so freaked out that he runs away naked. You're like, what is that? <laughs> but then John 
has connections, and so he gets into the high priest court, and, and Peter is kind of there, and Peter comes along, and Peter's kind of watching from a distance as this all takes place, and one, two, three, it happens, that someone says, wait, 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 you, you're, with, you're with Jesus, right? No, not me, no, no. By the third time, he's cussing. And he locks eyes with Jesus. The rooster crows. It's just like Jesus said. Can you imagine the deep shame? As Peter realizes, I've done it. And so then, it's amazing. Sunday morning comes. Ladies are running up. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. What? Peter and John take off running. John's way faster. Gets there first. He's kind of looking in. Peter just headlong straight into the tomb. It's empty. What is this? And then they come to a point a little while later. And you gotta, you gotta like put yourself into Peter's situation. Like all the emotions of what has happened. Like I, I did the thing he said. Like I denied him. He heard me. He looked me in the eyes. He pierced through my soul with his eyes as I'm cussing and saying I don't know the man. What kind of a failure am I? Guys, let's go fishing. And so a few of them jump in a boat and they spend all night fishing. And failure once again, we've caught nothing. And the sun starts to break the horizon and this glow is coming over and I see there's some guy on the shore and there's this little fire going and he starts screaming out 100 yards away and he says, hey, throw the net on the other side of the boat. Okay. They do it. They can't even drag the net in. And John looks at Peter and he says, it's the Lord. Peter throws his robe around himself, ties it off, and swims 100 yards to shore. He's got to get back to be with Jesus. That's Jesus on the shore. And he comes back to Jesus. And you know what the first thing that's there? I've just got to imagine that sensory experience. There's a charcoal fire that distinct smells. He sees the flames and he smells that. And he's got to be thinking back to just a few nights ago. You know what happened? I was warming myself by a charcoal fire. The description's in there. That detail's in the scriptures. That he's warming himself by a charcoal fire as another person says, wait a second, you're with him. No, not at all. No, 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 not with him. I go, oh God, why did I swim here before the others? Now I'm alone with Jesus. And the others finally get up there. And what does Jesus say? You know, Peter's waiting for him to just lay into him. Like, what would you be thinking? What's about to happen? And Jesus says, hey, I made breakfast. You guys want to eat with me? But he's got fish and bread there ready to go. And at some point, he gets Peter's attention. He says, let's go for a walk. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? And Peter starts to walk down the beach with Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, no, I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Wait, Peter, do you love me? No, Lord, you know I love you. I'll shepherd my flock. But Peter, do you love me? And just like he got to the point of cursing, he's getting riled up now. Cursing in his denial, he's riled up now in his affirmation. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And you imagine the weight of emotion behind that response. And Jesus again says, feed my sheep. That you've denied me three times, but in this grace, this moment of grace, Jesus restores him and says, we're good. We can often compare ourselves to ourselves, our own standard that we fall short of. And then this God of grace, the Lord of grace, takes us for a walk and says, I made you breakfast, but let's go talk. I want you to hear it. Kevin, do you love me? Tell you, know I love you. I need you to hear it, Kevin. Do you love me? You know I love you. Kevin, do you love me? You know everything. You know that I love you. And do what I called you to do. And follow me. And you imagine they're still walking down this beach. And Peter looks back over his shoulder. And there's John. And Jesus 
starts talking about, you know, when you were little, you, you tie your own belt on and you lead yourself where you want to go. But when you're old, someone else is going to tie you up and they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. So that's, that's the kind of death that I get to look forward to. He looks back over his shoulder again. There's John following. Uh, Jesus, what about him? And Jesus looks at him and says, if you were to remain until I come back again, what's that to you? You follow me. Let's pray. Spirit, would you move in us? Would you shape us to be people who see this kind of grace and live in light of it? Would you free us from the bondage of comparison? Would you help us to understand your extravagant love? You're for us. Oh, we love you. Would you bless this church and use us as we follow you the circumstances of our lives may be very different, but God, help us to see what is to come. The eternal life, to be repaid a hundredfold. That's what's in store for us, but it's just you. Because so we have nothing in heaven or on earth that we desire but you. You are our exceeding reward. So we love you, we long for you. Would you show us your face? I pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.